Hi, I'm Tyra G., your host for Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Welcome again to our virtual, global gathering of phenomenal people. Yes, you, fearsome and generous, humble and honest, in pursuit of new possibilities and purpose. Every week we meet for an hour to experience, educate, encourage, and empower each other through our joy, our aha moments, and stories that have been left in our pockets for too long. You know, we're going to share some information that tradition tells us there's some things we just don't talk about. But not at this table. Here we live beyond the wreckage. Each week we begin right where we are. You're listening to Radio Fairfax, Fairfax, Virginia, on your TV, computer, or mobile device. And we are webcast worldwide on the internet at www.radiofairfax.org every Saturday evening at 8 o'clock. Yeah, I know. I know that's date night, and that's okay. Because you can catch our podcast on YouTube. All you have to do is type in Frankly Speaking with Tyra G., And if you feel like connecting with me offline, as some of you are enjoying doing, you know I love it too, just email me at tyra at tyragarlington.com. And thank you, Courtney Nero, for composing and performing our theme song and for naming it, I'm Listening. Our theme this month is thank you for your service then and now. I am passionately celebrating veterans and active duty military who continually help to sustain and help us to sustain, excuse me, and maintain our quality of life. We're also going to highlight the things they're contributing to and continually uh, being productive in after their service. If you're like me, you're going to learn something new about something old. This November and December, we'll hear stories through diverse lens to include the wars fought, age, gender, race, family, impact, cultural, and social legacies. So far, we've heard stories from Mary Jesse Herrera, a 100-pound, 20-year-old military policewoman who wore her accessories an M16 and a 9mm sidearm in Iraq after being wounded in an ambush while taking prisoners in Fallujah and 20 operations putting her arm back together. She is raising two lovely daughters and has her master's degree. We talked to George Bodie, an African-American officer. At 22, in the Vietnam War, he had to manage the implications, the cultural and social implications of the first United States fully integrated army, which also saw the highest proportion of blacks ever to serve in the American War. We heard heart-to-heart stories from women and their decisions and consequences thereof to serve in Vietnam as nurses, as librarians, and as social support personnel. We also heard stories that brought tears to our eyes from wives of POWs, prisoners of war, and military widows. Considering this is the 100th year anniversary of World War I, I am sharing a personal World War story one story to establish our traditional common thought space. Each week, we will step back into once upon a time a hundred years ago. And I quote, World War I is among the least documented wars of those covered by the Veterans History Project and the number of collections relating its experience is not likely to grow dramatically. Every veteran has his or her own war and each is a custodian of a unique story and memories. Because all but a handful of World War I vets are no longer alive, oral history interviews are our only way of gaining content. We do this through relatives and friends. This is a story about William Anderson, submitted and told by Nathaniel Jenkins, Jr., a grandson. And I quote, My father, William 
Anderson was a real American hero. He was quiet and warm, a jack of all trades, born in the 1800s, and he lived a humble life in Asheville, North Carolina. He was a part of an all-black regiment that fought with French soldiers against the Germans during World War I. When my mother would take me and my sisters to visit them, he would frequently show us his medal that he had tucked away in an old, tarnished, tin sucre fox. The medal, shaped like an iron cross, backed by cross swords, was marred with time, and it had an aged green and red ribbon attached. My grandfather would beam with pride every time he displayed the medal. But as little kids, we didn't understand the significance of his pride. Apparently, he wanted his grandchildren and great-grandchildren to know what he had done. Many years later, I discovered that Grandfather Anderson's efforts on the battlefield earned him the coveted French medal, the Cross of War, for bravery in combat action. That's the same honor given Adi Murphy, the most decorated American combat soldier in World War II. The citation accompanying the medal revealed that William Anderson, formerly a private in Company D, 93rd Division, America, American Ex Expeditionary Force, was awarded the Cross of War for actions in the course of a campaign, 1914 to 1918, against Germany and her allies. Anderson was a workhorse of Company D. He was a machine gunner. His personal war history was revealed during an interview he had in 1970 with Bob Terrell, a local newspaper reporter. And his story was published in an article in the Asheville Cit Citizen's Times. He says, I didn't do nothing special that night. I just stood and fought, and I never turned back. Grandfather talked about some of the close calls he had during the war. Once when guarding the Hindenburg Line, the border between France and Germany, a terrible skirmish erupted. He was one of only a few survivors out of his 130-man unit. Every time they needed someone for patrol duty, they called his name and he never missed one. They would slither out of the trenches, crawl through no man's land, cut through the barbed wire, and look for troop movements, weapons displacements, or anything of interest to his side. On one occasion, a German patrol was 10 feet away. He said, so close, I knew they could hear my heart beating. He remembered when the company broke through the Hindenburg line. The memories of the dead and the dying were vivid. We walked over dead like ants. We wanted to stop and do something for the lame and hurt, but our orders were forward march. And we kept marching. A few years ago, my wife was invited to speak about Granddaddy Anderson at several high schools in Fredericksburg, Virginia during Black History Months. She showed students the framed certificate he received, now yellow with age, and held up a copy of a newspaper story. My mother sent me a copy of the newspaper article about Granddaddy's Vallow while I was serving in the United States Air Force in the 1970s. It inspired me to make a military career, and I retired after, excuse me, nearly 23 years of service my wife and I are proud to be a part of families with a tradition of military service. My brother is working or served during the Vietnam War. His son, Tori, is a veteran who served during Operation Enduring Freedom in the Middle East. We are honored to be a part of Granddaddy's military history. After our break, we're gonna listen to stories about some of the impacts of war on families and we'll hear it through the voices of a son and a father a father who served in desert storm one and two so grab a snack get comfortable stay close now and we are back welcome herschel holiday senior and herschel holiday junior finally call junior Mm -hmm. to Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. And we have a special surprise in the studio. We have the loving support of Mrs. Herschel Holiday. 
She's waving. It's a radio show. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, Herschel Sr., I ask each one of my guests to take the role of a book in a human library and introduce yourself in a way that would make the listening audience want to read the entire book. Tell us why you are who you are and how you got to be this way. Well, good evening, first of all, and uh, thanks for inviting us here. Um, if I were a book and I wanted you to continue to read through, I would probably open up with uh, humble beginnings and then uh, having stayed the course and arrived at this particular point. Um, I started out uh, at high school playing football and some of the other sports, so I was an athlete somewhat. Got interested in going to college, and then college got it became interested in me, and, and that worked well. And my, one of my guidance counselors says, said if you go, and some of the military academies were looking, and one was West Point, and one of my, my guidance counselors said, if you go there, you, you will do well, you won't want for anything in the future. And I said, that's hard to believe, but I'll take, take your chance. And of course, I chose to do it because it was away from home and I could get out and see what the rest of the world looked like. It was in New York, and I thought it was New York City, of course, and of course <laughs> it, was, it was upstate New York and away from some of those things, or most of those things, so uh, in New York City. Anyway. That was by design, you know. By design, yes. yes. You had to get keep some, create some distance. So. <laughs> Absolutely. So it was fairly uh, austere, to, uh -huh. to say the least. But went through there, and I obviously wanted to you know, leave and wasn't quite sure where I was going because I didn't have a military family. Uh, I guess they say it kind of skips a generation or so, but didn't have that, so I so I decided to concentrate on getting out and you know uh, and then looking for the, what what was next and mm -hmm. so but as a five year requirement to serve in the military after that so so one thing led to the next. Of course, I got married during that time period. My wife was also at the time was also in the, in the, at West Point graduate, so we. We, we uh, continued on through, and we went to, off to Germany and off to the many places. It was primarily during the peacetime era. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. was the call of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So we, and as you well know, in the, in the Constitution, uh, it, it says that Congress must raise an army, but it says it maintains a Navy. So we need a Navy for our trade and all the other things. Mm -hmm. But for the Army, we raise an army because that's, there's a historical fear of having a standing army mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a country, and you see that in the other parts of the world. They become disgruntled and unruly and becomes a challenge for the government, stability, et cetera. So the army would take a dip after certain things, and, and it, was, it, it becomes small. After, it was after the Vietnam War, so mm -hmm. the army became very, very small and uh, reduced size. But we had the Cold War, too, so we maintained uh, positions and look and uh, presence in Europe and Korea mm -hmm. in order to contain the Soviet expansion uh, during that time period. So I would only I would say that I kind of had the patience to kind of stick around. And I'll also also say overall the military isn't for everyone. So I never never uh, I, I no, no one needs to be ashamed or feel uncomfortable about not having served. But it seemed to fit for me. So okay. we continued along that route. And then uh, about uh, later on in my career, the wars started to happen. So it was about the 12th, 13th year or so. No, not even that far. About my, I guess I had been in about eight years or so. I had been in Germany and Korea, so I'd kind of seen some of the world. And then uh, we had the first Gulf War when Saddam Hussein crossed over into Kuwait and started to have his way for that with that country, and we didn't like it. So we went over to try to, number one, stop the the bleeding and then push him out of Kuwait and that's what we did uh, I didn't go directly over there I tried to at the time uh, my wife at the time did go and uh, but I went to I Egypt and worked with the Egyptian army to try to help them get prepared okay I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put a comma there okay because you said something that was loaded mm -hmm. that needs to be unpacked okay. your wife went mm-hmm how 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 are those decisions made? She went and you went to Egypt. Yes, uh, when you're both in the military, you know, if if you get the call, then you go, or else you get out. It's mm -hmm. kind of kind of the choice there. So you don't get uh, you don't necessarily get a choice in 
where you want to go because she was in a different unit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had been in a, that type of unit when I was in Korea. So I had done my particular duty or required job in that area. Now, help us Korea. understand what that is well, because there's a lot that goes on, a lot of jobs that keep yeah. a, a, yeah. an army going. So what oh, did yeah. you do? Well, there are several jobs and several levels. Yes. Uh, but one, particularly, they want you to be, when you start off as a lieutenant, you want to be a platoon leader. So you are a leader right away after West, Bond, exactly. West Point. Exactly. Okay. And then after that, you may serve on the staff for a while. But when you become a captain, mm -hmm. which is normally the three to five year uh, period, you become a company commander. You okay. Know, those, those are check marks to have done those jobs to move forward. So I had done that in Korea. And okay. when I came out, this particular war started. She was doing that same job in Kentucky and uh, Fort Knox. And so I wasn't. I was, in a, I was teaching, actually. And they pulled me out of teaching and said, hey, go over and work with the Egyptian Army. Okay, so for th our listeners, we are looking at two individuals mm -hmm. who went to West Point, which automatically says you're being prepared to be a leader. Yes. People need to understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a, a wonderful, rich history of preparing leaders. Mm -hmm. Now, you and your wife, first of all, a woman at West Point, mm -hmm is kind of a special thing. Mm -hmm. An African-American woman at West Point is even more special. We need to let people understand mm -hmm. that just this isn't a run-of-a-mill experience, right? Mm -hmm. So she's at Fort Knox going through the steps that she needs to go through, and you're in Korea. Yes. And yes. you all are married or not? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Well, that's a dynamic that well, we we're, We started off in Korea together. I had to stay f for some additional time with this particular job. Okay. She came back a little sooner. Okay. Only about nine months or so. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is going to take us out of the storytelling mode. What'd that feel like? Being separated. Somebody's in one country, somebody's in another. You're married. You both can't, you know, there had to be some kind of feeling or thought behind that. Well, that's kind of what I suppose the training or West Point uh, allowed you to do to understand that sometimes it, life was going to be difficult. Okay. And that you were going to have some separation. Okay. Um, having grown up in, in Rome and in Georgia, the normal town, mm -hmm. I know that that would be diff different and difficult for people. But in that in that vein, in that time, we mm -hmm. felt like, okay, this is time. Okay, there was a national emergency. It was time to do those things that you had to do. On, on a normal circumstances, probably not. We would okay. say, okay, that's, that's not for us. Or if it was a corporation or so, a job or something, you'd have to really weigh the cost and benefits of yes. separating. Yes, yes, yes. But yes. in times of emergency, such as war, you know, we've seen enough of the movies and we talked mm -hmm. to and, and knew enough people to say that this is going, this needs to happen. So. And, and what we're talking about when we're thinking Desert Storm, that's like the first mm -hmm. war after the Cold War. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay, so we're changing our paradigm at the same time as a country. Yes. Okay, yes. all right. Mm -hmm. I interrupted you now. We're past the comma. Continue. Okay, okay. so that war particularly, that, that one ended. We all kind of came home. Everybody was in decent shape. It was okay. A, it was, uh, and uh, so um, we, had, uh, we had a family at the time. The family started to grow. We moved around a lot of places in the, after all of that. So we were in Kentucky, then we moved to Fort Hood, Texas, and then from Texas to Kansas City, Kansas for uh, for schooling. I uh, was there for two years, and then back to Korea. This time as with the family, and then after Korea, we came to the D.C. area. Hmm. So okay, and it was here I started working the Pentagon, and in some cases, the Pentagon can be as demanding as uh, as as deploying to uh, to combat. Or so and so, sure. for our international and for our younger listeners. Tell them what the Pentagon, Pentagon is all about. The Pentagon is a large uh, military uh, office building, basically. Huge. Huge. And it's about answering questions and, and, uh, and, and managing a large force, uh, with military force. Now, again, it's the Army, Navy, the Air Force, Marines, in some cases the Coast Guard. And uh, what it does is, is it processes information. Uh, and, and, and basically Congress runs the Army, tells us how big we ought to be, mm -hmm. and then we, we say, okay, and then it gives us a list of things they want us to do. Why and is it called the Pentagon? The Pentagon is, 
has five sides. There you go. Uh, and it was built uh, right before leading into World War II. Uh-huh. The reason be- behind it was that we had a lot of buildings throughout D.C. where the military w- were occupying. Okay. And someone said, let's get us all in one building. Okay. Yeah, so. All right. So now you're home. Yes. Okay. You and your wife and your family mm-hmm. are here. Mm-hmm. And have you thought about a strategy or are you just letting the military define your future? Have you thought about, oh, five years from now I want to do this? Well, once you, uh, as we arrived at the Pentagon about the 18th year mark. Okay. Mark. Okay. And so uh, the consideration was, okay, we can do two more years. We'll retire in 20 years. That's, that's nominal. That's, uh, that's un- understandable. But before we arrived, 9-11 had occurred. Okay. Okay, so I always say there's always a crisis. Yep. And you, and when I, I was in the Pentagon three times and for at three different times, and every time there was a crisis. So the first time I went, it was right after 9-11. It was 2002, the spring of 2002. Mm-hmm. And we were pre- preparing to do many of our counterattacks. Mm-hmm. We were moving forces into Iraq, a correction, and in, into Kuwait to prepare for the assault into Iraq. Um, so... That was the, that time period. So I worked with those areas, and we were transforming the Army at the same time. About two and a half years into that, so it was about 2005, they call, I might, we, the insurgency started. So okay, this, I'm going to put another comma. Okay. All right. 9-11 was such, so out of our, our belief space mm-hmm. as citizens of the United States, we are being attacked on our home soil. Mm-hmm. Okay. So... I know how I felt, and I know what I was doing, and everybody I know knows how they felt. You're in the military. What was happening in your head? I mean, like, usually you're going over there Mm -hmm. to accomplish something, and now it has happened here. Mm -hmm. And you were in the Pentagon. Were were you in the Pentagon 9-11? I was in Korea when it actually happened. Okay, all right. So what kind of feelings did, did it had to be a different kind of feeling than what you'd had all these other 20 years. Uh, exactly. And what you're describing is the military tries to maintain an overmatch. In other words, we want to be that much better than our yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, compa- our, our, our threats or our enemies. Yes. And we weren't realized we were vulnerable. So for the first time, that, that kind of caught us uh, uh, caught us off guard. We were in Korea. We were all there together. And we started to think there may be a planned attack. So there may be... There may be a coordinated attack. So yeah. we went on high alert there in Korea as well. So everyone responded to it and, okay. uh, and uh, prepared for it. So when you say uh, high alert, what does that mean? High alert means you kind of lock the gates, you, you ratchet up your security checks, and you ensure that only people come on post uh, are people that are authorized to do so. Uh-huh. Uh, certain things, you know, and it kind of it pulled us out of our comfort zone. So people who are the normal dental technician uh, that's normally checking or helping you, you know, floss the teeth and all that is now walking around with an M16 around the gates. Now, see, that's an image. That That's what I'm trying to get to. Mm-hmm. Stuff changed. Yes, it did. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm thinking of processes. I was working for IBM, and I was at the time, mm-hmm. and I was thinking I traveled every week. Mm-hmm. Travel changed, okay? It used to be kind of fun to get on the plane. No, security changed. So for the first time in my life, Mm -hmm. I felt unsafe. And that has a lot to do, in my opinion, in in changing society Mm -hmm. and the kind of legislation and priorities and things we're doing. So that's kind of what I was asking because you were in a role that had to respond. Mm -hmm. But I know somewhere inside of you probably going, what? Aren't we better than this? True. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It, travel, you know, all the, the security checks, multiple yeah. checks yeah, yeah, here yeah. and there. So, yeah. So it became a, a challenge to us psychologically. So what kind of pressures and stress did you feel as a leader? D- you can pick any time during your career that I took you way out of your comfort zone. Well, I'll tell you what. When I was in Iraq, we were trying to figure out what to do next. Um, I was in, now I was a little more senior than perhaps some of your, your guests during the time I was there. So in the crux okay. of that of that atmosphere, we were trying to solve problems for, to, to report to the generals. Okay. I had to, re, re, had to brief uh, the senior guy uh, every Sunday night because, remember, 
Sunday night was like Monday in, in Iraq because uh-huh. they did have a tif- different Sunday, a different Sabbath day. Right, but right, right. anyway, I had to go into it, and it was almost like going behind the, uh, the curtain in the old biblical, going behind the screen, and they tie a rope to you just in case if you didn't make it out. They can they, pull they you drag out. You out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because him and all the other ones were around listening to what my team came up with each Sunday night. Okay. And I could tell you, I could tell it was difficult because – I'd try to pre-brief my 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 immediate supervisors, and they said, "Just just go on with what you have. I'm we sure we're sure it's good enough because they didn't want any part of it. We had to really pull out and discover what was happening in Korea in, in Iraq and mm-hmm. how we would push forward. What would be the next steps? And we realized, and, and mm-hmm. since then, instead of worrying and being so anxious about it all, some problems you just simply have to manage. We had significant amounts of of attacks each day, uh, a lot of a lot of casualties. Uh, it's like forty or fifty per, per per day, and we and we wondered how do we stop that? How do we get ahead of that? And also protecting the Iraqi people. How do we get out ahead of them? How do we encourage them not to to assemble in large areas so some someone might drive up a, with a car bomb, et cetera? So how do we protect them? How do we change their culture uh, and how they do business? So. These were all things we were trying to work with all the time with a few tools to really get at all of this. And they had people coming in and out, but certainly in terms of smart people and, and uh, knowledgeable people. So it, this, was, this was our challenge, and I had to lead a small group uh, to do that. And that was probably the diff- most difficult thing is to how do we make progress with it. And I heard you say two things that right away I tensed when you said, how do we change their culture? Mm-hmm. How do, we're, you're, in, you're a guest mm-hmm. in their country, and yes, you're there for protection and strategy, et cetera, but that's a whole different paradigm. Mm-hmm. That's a different country. That's a different faith base. Mm-hmm. That's a different culture. What did you do about language, and, 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 and how did religion get all mixed up in that, and how did your faith play into it? Oh, okay. That's a good point. Um, whenever I go overseas, and I've done several times alone, uh, I've taken my Bible with me and tried to read it all the way through. That was all my, always my goal. So I always have that goal as a get back so I can find some time to, to catch up or to stay, stay on pace with my reading. And in that reading, I, I become very, very close to God. Nothing gets you quite as close when you don't have a whole lot of other obstacles in your, in your way. And so I appreciated that, that time. It was almost like my, my time of medita- meditation or going away to uh, my, like a convent somewhere uh, away from you know, normal reality, et cetera. So that was good. And um, so, so how – now I kind of lost your question. You said how – Well, uh, let's, let's stay with what you said. Yeah. That's what you were doing. If you look to your right and to your left yeah. at U.S. soldiers, did you see a lot of evidence of faith, behavior, prayer, that kind of thing, or was, was it just kind of you? Sometimes you did, sometimes you didn't. Okay. Okay. Uh, I went, there were, there were, there were services then mm-hmm. available that people would go to. I remember distinctly sitting on a bench one morning and a bomb went off somewhere and knocked it right off the bench. Yeah, so it was, uh, so you had that as well. And then some people kind of relied on themselves mm-hmm. and some people didn't know exactly where to go. So, mm-hmm. however, there was, uh, and there was the challenge too, moving over there. I remember going through Kuwait. They were very, suspicious of our religious material they would try to take our Bible that's what I want to get to you know yeah. because and it goes back to what mm-hmm. I was saying how do you change a culture yeah and here we come the U.S. with a tradition of being the world this and mm-hmm. the world that mm-hmm. and and yet mm-hmm. you know if you're going against your God and somebody else's God that's a whole nother uh war at another level true true and so that's that's what I was trying to understand because I cannot possibly because yeah. I never walked your shoes. Yeah. Um, the what I've discovered there working in the Middle East and I've been there a couple of times. Yeah. It's they don't mind you worshiping your own God and your okay. own faith. Okay. Uh, okay. And but don't mess with theirs. Okay. You okay. don't get in the middle. You don't. You don't try to. They'll. You can do about anything you want in that area, but okay. don't get in the way. Of their 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 worship, because there is a hidden concern that we are proselytizing over there for the for we're you know the old crusades that kind of set a yeah. set a bad taste in the whole world sure. so everybody kind of 
is are very suspicious when America or a Christian nation right, moves right. out in those areas. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm just thinking in my head, that's big. Mm-hmm. Everything you've talked about, we just kind of told it like you were reading a report. Mm-hmm. But you were a human being. Mm-hmm. You had a wife and a family, mm-hmm. and you're in a place that's unsafe, and you're during a time that you don't know that tomorrow will be there. Mm-hmm. And so in my mind, when I translate that, that's got to be scary as I don't know what. Mm-hmm. So um, let me congratulate you and thank you for your service. And uh, I want to get to post-service. Mm-hmm. You have been channeled to be a leader Mm -hmm. and you are a father Mm -hmm. and you have a family let's mix all that up together and uh let's 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 bring junior in the conversation because there's residue Mm -hmm. of everything we've talked about whether it's overt you brought back something of what happened to you during that time into the family and what that felt like and Mm -hmm. I don't know whether this even makes sense to answer, Junior, but mm-hmm. how old were you when you became conscious of your father in war, his role, and your mom? What was that like? Oh, I, w- I was conscious when he left. Okay. Because, mm-hmm. And uh, how old were you then? Well, he left in the, in the middle of my third grade year, so I might have just turned eight. Okay. And I must have been nine when he came back. Yeah. It was two th- you were gone in 2005, mm-hmm. and I was born in 96, so that's mm-hmm. the year I turned nine. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And can you get in touch with what it felt like, his exit and coming back? Well, you know, and it's funny now because I today I'm 22. It's 2018. And I was born in 96. So today I'm 22. And it's it's very easy to, to go to go back then and be like, oh, I went through that. Oh, you know, I went I went through it. I like who I am today. Great. And then, and then it's another thing to go back to that time and remember any sort of fear and anxiety that I had back then. Um, and I do remember there, I, there, there are snapshots and snippets cause, cause memory back then is so, yeah. you know, it's very touch point and, and mm-hmm. this and that. Mm-hmm. And I remember I loved, and I still love the show and I can watch it. I love the show Jeopardy. And I only, I only ever knew it as Jeopardy with the, excla- with the exclamation mark and Alex Trebek and this is the show. Mm-hmm. Then I actually learned the definition of the word. And people use the word saying, we are putting soldiers' lives in jeopardy. And I'm like, is that what that means? Mm-hmm. And that, so it, 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 that age is an interesting age to have a parent deployed because you are still coming to grips with how society functions. Yes, yes, yes. I was that right because it was, you know, Bush had just been reelected. Mm-hmm. That was my first time watching an election. And we had moved a lot, but by that point we lived in the house that I would graduate high school out of. Okay. So I had more stability than other army brats that I know who moved every two years through high school. I didn't have that. I, I had the stability of one home. But as soon as we had that, one year after we moved in, we moved in January 20, 2004. The next January, after we celebrated Christmas and New Year's, it was understood. Me and my sister were made to aware of the fact that dad would be gone and wouldn't come back until the next January. And you had a two week, I'm surprised I remember a lot of this. You had a two week um, recess where you came in that August, I recall. R&R, they call it. R&R, okay. Uh, something, something. Uh, recreations, and uh, uh, probably. It. it was two hours, I'll think of it. One of them's recreation. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, was I answering your question right? You were. Oh, I, yeah. I, there's no mm-hmm. right or wrong. Oh, what yes. I was hoping we could get to would be the touch points yeah, that you yeah. could share with your dad. And I don't know if you've ever shared with your dad what that time period was like. I don't know if you ever talked about being away from the family and what with, oh. with, with Junior, what oh, yeah. that felt like. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I'm, just, I'm just bursting to try to tell my, my touch point, I guess you might say. Because at one point, uh, I remember distinctly, because this war, this time, we had – really good communications we had phones we had mm. everybody even cell phones so that at some point but you had communications back to your your family mm-hmm. and i would call home i think because we were 12 hours exactly 12 mm-hmm. hours just dis- dis- difference so i would call home about six o'clock my time it's about dinner time etc yeah. so call home things were kind of slow 
where I worked at the time. So I called and catch them kind of getting up and getting ready to go and all that. So I would call home, and all, most of the time it was well-received and all. But I remember at some point it became, and then I could help. I could call home and I said, you know, we're looking for that orange T-shirt. If you know what it was, okay, it's down the mm-hmm. drawer in the junior's room or, or Desiree's room, et cetera. So I could help out. I felt like I was part. I was helping even though I was far away. And then it came to a point where I couldn't help anymore. Number one, I couldn't remember everything. And number two, it was bothersome. I could just feel the tension in my wife's voice because I'd call and uh, it, it was like, oh, you, it's you again. We really have to go. You're not here. Yeah, you can't help him do. We had settled into a group without you. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. It was, and yeah. and let's 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 say that again, mm-hmm. because it happens. It mm-hmm. doesn't mean there's any less love, but right. the human nature is to adapt. Yeah. Right. And so what you had was a home mm-hmm. life that had new processes and things that worked, and what you had was, hey, mm-hmm. I love you. I'm dad. I'm still here, mm-hmm. and you just said a word. I wasn't needed anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you know, behind those words, at least when I felt that way, there's a lot of emotion. Oh yeah. 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 So, so how did y'all get the at home? How did you get that system working so well? I don't. I don't recall you calling in the morning. I don't. I only recall you calling on Sundays, which now that I think about it, you calling in daylight, Mm -hmm. and because you were 12 hours different. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm trying to reckon how what time it might have been for you but I remember being there were there are three moments I remember being very upset at your not at your absence but being upset with the situation because I understood you know dad didn't pick up and move to Iraq (laughs) like I understood that (laughs) Mm -hmm. but um being very you know upset with the situation just dealing with the angst of it all um first was um one day we were at meditation and altar call at our church which is something we do every Sunday where we all pray and hold hands. And when you're young, you're just kind of standing there and it's dark. And and, um, and I just remember being very upset with the situation and needing to step out. I remember that moment. I remember one time, it, I believe it was in the February that you were gone, you mentioned that a bomb had been found in the, your workplace and it was disarmed and you were fine. Um, but I didn't want to hear about that. That, that was something that very much upset me because I'm like, oh, no, I didn't realize, you know, the mortal danger. And, you and you know, the news was not helping. I was watching the news because I wanted to see, you know, what, not, you know, let's learn about the troop movements. But I just wanted to know what was going on. And they would, they would document, here's who we lost this week. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, Numbers. more, more mm-hmm. than you could count on your hands. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it was just a very scary prospect. The last time was actually after you came back and we were in my aunt's basement and you were showing us pictures of your trip and one of the pictures was um, the vehicle you had been traveling in and all the bullet holes that it had. And I couldn't, I don't remember if you said you were in the vehicle at the time, but being reminded, it's one thing, like separation was one thing, but like, you know, because, you know, kids have their dads go to business in Germany for a year or whatever. Like That's one thing. It's the separation plus the knowing that you, are in mortal danger and that you know you miss us we miss you so that was those were the kinds of things that were definitely um like stressors at the time that i i I, it would be incorrect to say that they vanished when you returned but i do not remember long lasting you know um misgivings or scars from it i do remember though at the time having those and those again, uh, yeah. memory is often a protective covering, mm-hmm. and it helps us move from one point to another as necessary. Right. I'm thinking, oh, Lord, it must have been another century. I taught first, second, and third grade, mm-hmm. and I remember what happened to the third graders. It was a big jump in emotional development mm-hmm. between second and third grade, mm-hmm. and uh, I look now, and that's kind of like when children – start othering, Mm -hmm. you know, like we and you and separation kinds of things and bullying gets uh, magnified. So it's a very emotional year for people and uh, for little people. And I appreciate what you're saying. I think it's amazing 
that you're in touch with some of the, I can remember critical moments. And I think what your words are saying now is descriptive, but I suspect as a third grader, mm -hmm. it was a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. And there was probably a lot of fear for your dad, mm -hmm. but it was something you couldn't, you didn't have yet the tools yeah. to, to communicate that in a way that made, you were just frightened and frustrated. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, that's, I think one of the things if if someone were to I think the way the way that I you know perceive the world the way anyone perceives the world had you know they owe a lot to their upbringing and I had I had two parents in the army mom did 20 years dad wound up doing 30 uh, when all was said and done um, and like dad said earlier there was you had oh no you know problem here but here is the you know it's never just problem and panic. It was, oh, issue, and here are a set of solutions. Which one should we go with? If this goes wrong, here are the other plans. And so dad, mom and dad very much, I think, personified that sort of, yes, this is a problem, but we're going to get through it, sort of atmosphere, as opposed to, oh, no, there's a problem. What are we going to do? And so it was, it was understanding, like, yes, there is, there is the risk here, but, you know, don't lose sleep over this. It's going, it is going to be okay. Not that we hope, we are, we're pretty sure. But that was like the, the, the unspoken understanding between me and my sister and my mom. So it was comfort. Yes. The process yeah. led to comfort and mm -hmm. you could sleep. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you mentioned, and I, I don't want to beat this horse until it never comes alive again, but you mentioned I'm over in Iraq and I couldn't find the orange T-shirt. Mm -hmm. What else happened to you? We just do this for a couple of minutes because I want to move on to something else. Mm -hmm. You're away. We hear Junior saying the kinds of things, processes they put in place to survive at home without you. What did you do away without them knowing you couldn't solve that, that problem or you couldn't see your daughter's eyes or your son's eyes and translate that into something that was familiar to you? What was that like? Well... And you try you try to be as little of a burden as possible to the one. family back to, there. To the family back there, you know they're going through all those things. But well, what is that doing to you? Well, you have to really, really struggle to maintain your your biblical studies and uh, continue to read the Bible, knowing that uh, this will li this will end at some point. Okay. Um, uh, in terms of becoming too depressed, I try to be busy. Okay. I, we were okay. busy. We stayed busy trying to figure out and, and, and change the direction of that particular So war. you were really immersed I tried to get, in I tried solutioning. To immersed. Yes, I tried to stay immersed in And that. that's a good diversion. Uh, we saw people, we, uh, we, there were losses, and uh, you felt badly about those. Mm -hmm. But uh, the goal was to try to, try to st remain uh, steady and try to help your, the boss solve this problem okay. because the whole country was kind of getting a little bit tired of the war. Yeah. And you got to understand that. Yeah. And so the president was calling them and saying, hey, what are we doing? When are we going to get this? When are mm -hmm. we going to find Bin Lot, for, for example? And there mm -hmm. were other bad guys that we had targeted. Okay. So we had all kinds of different schemes to go after those, those okay. people. So that's kind of where I stayed. I, I kind of stayed in that mode. And I said, if I could just do this, because unlike Vietnam, I said, well, more like Vietnam, but unlike World War I mm -hmm. and World War II for that matter, people went for the duration. Here, you went for a, a particular time period. Yes, you kind of knew yes. there was a time period you were, you were going to leave. Now, some people got extended, of course. But for the most part, you knew about how much time you, had, you were going to be there. So you gave it all you had, and you stayed as busy as possible. And then when it was time to go, uh, you said goodbye and you departed. So, so I'm hearing you say that uh, war, what you needed to do in your role as a leader— that job helped you survive the separation, anxiety of not being with your family. Yes, you just I, focus on that. Yes, I had people that I was in charge of, responsible yeah, for, and yeah. their safety and their, their health. And when you're responsible for people in a situation That's like true. that, you've got to look upon them and say, hey, you, know, you get enough sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, you get enough to eat. Mm -hmm. or you doing, There's plenty of food, but some people don't have to eat. Some people got in trouble uh, here and there on other things. I mean, we had computers and other things. So you had to just kind of maintain that morale mm -hmm. to, to tell them that, okay, you're going to go back to whatever was back in the world. 
uh, with husbands, wives, whatever it was. So you need to prepare yourself for that. So this now is that we, that that's what last night's um, conversation mm-hmm. uh, was talking about transformation that's required mm-hmm. of a soldier when he comes home, and sometimes that's unfair mm-hmm. to make you go from soldier to dad like that, and and things happen to you that don't easily translate into a home model. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, he was talking about things you don't forget, Mm -hmm. things that you've seen that you don't forget, and you need help working through that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now, you having a spouse that was in military, I imagine that helped, I don't know, maybe I should ask, did that help leveling when you finally came home? Uh, Getting you, reentry, that's what I'm talking about, into the family. That helps. That helps. Uh, I would say that um, it had been a little while since she had been deployed in that manner. So some of maybe, you know, it, it doesn't. It all you always lose a little bit after time. Time heals all wounds and mm-hmm, all mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. allows that forget uh, you to forget. I think the biggest time the chan- uh, challenge I had was a reentry back into the work world. I came home in like January the 16th, so it was cold. I came out, out from a very warm place <laughs> to a co- very cold place, and then I was back in the Pentagon. And here we are running through and th- uh, running again. And I was feeling basically like, like okay, let's slow down a little bit and let's, let's try to try to absorb mm-hmm. and process. Did you have and time to decompress between? Not, not really. Okay. And, uh, you know, you always think, and they would always say, go home, go home. But, you know, really there was stuff to do. And yeah, you got yeah, a new yeah. job, you got in process, you got to pass this, that, and the other. And we don't do a very good job of that. I know I had a British, uh, we had a lot of Brit- we had a lot of different countries working with right, right, British, right. Australian, et cetera. And one guy said that when the British Army, well, they don't need you. They say, well, we don't report here in six months, and you can do whatever you want to do and, uh, and not have to, you know, but we have to have leave. We have to have, you know, times Our off, structure. et cetera. Yeah. Exactly. But I didn't do any of that. And I came home, and my, my wife, you know, they were supportive of my coming home. But she was a school teacher. And mm-hmm. you know, school teachers have to be at school. Yes, I know uh, about uh, school uh, teachers. Exactly. <laughs> so that's something you just have to be. Family, they have to do their thing. Right, Music right, right. lessons, whatever it is, they got to do that. And I have to pick up and start doing my bus driving and et cetera. So nothing really, you don't slow down very much. So yeah. there was a period of slow processing that I went through, and I remember that. And okay. uh, so, yeah. Well, I want you to. To I want we actually have a double treat because you know I always ask my guests to to read a letter they've written to their younger self, which generally gives us an indication of their journey. Uh, but prior to that, I want you to see if you can get in touch with the most important thing. You don't have to say it now. You can read your letter. Most important thing you learned about your military experience, and I want you. Junior, to think about the most important thing you thought about or learned having an absentee father for a year, knowing he was in danger. Mm-hmm. Okay, and and you know, we don't have to have an answer to that, but I want you to think about it. And who wants to go first reading that letter? Well, me too. You want to? Okay. Want to? I, all right. I want to. I'll start. Okay. All right. So, <coughs> my letter to. To me. Okay. Mm-hmm. It says, Dear Herschel, as you start your journey through life, the most basic guidance that I can offer is to learn how to pray, read your Bible, and get to know the Lord. Second, don't give up. My greatest regrets in life are things that I did not try to fix. In most cases, we are redirected in different experiences for many reasons. Sometimes you will arrive at a logical We arrive at logical transitions. However, quitting is different. It normally leaves a bad taste and years of regret. Avoid at all costs. Third, and and my favorite saying, if you lean against the door and the door opens wide open, then go through it. There may be ups and downs. However, this is likely the right choice for you. Fourth, simply live. Live a full life. Everybody has to die, but not everyone has to chooses to live. Relationships are great. Marriage, family, and children are excellent. These experiences will help you grow up and develop. 
They will help you mature to be the man that God wants you to become. When you have the option to sit it out or dance, I hope that you will dance. Finally, life is complex. There will be tons of ups and downs. You will be humbled, knocked down, confused, etc. You will also experience long periods when you feel that God is not listening to, to you. But hold on, keep the faith. When knocked down, always get up. Never stay down, never roll over. Remember these ideas, and you will do well. And that's it. I think that's very good advice. Junior? I, I wrote my letter to uh, my, my freshman self. I, I just graduated from school. So. Wonderful. Yes. And it reads, Dear Herschel, has it really been four years already? They told you time would fly by this quickly, but you don't believe them. That's okay. At any rate, you do wind up graduating, so congrats in advance on that. You'll be one of the first in your class to land a job, and the signing bonus won't hurt either. What will hurt are the times you doubt yourself. Doubt is akin to an army routing from the battlefield. Self-defeat. Be wary of your inner critic. He's dumb. Don't listen to him. (laughs) Every experience has good. Today's lemons are tomorrow's lemon butter. You're 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 not going to remember that in the moment. In the moment, lemons are lemons and lemons suck. You may need a reminder every now and again. That's okay, too. You'll need reminders to cut yourself slack and to cut yourself loose. You'll need reminders to call family. You'll need reminders to sleep, to launder, and yes, even to eat. You'll need reminders to play. You'll need reminders to pray. You'll need to surround yourself with the friends and supporters who will know when to give you those reminders. This is a different game. You will not and cannot be all things to all people at all times. You will adjust and learn to forgive yourself. I know this because I've already forgiven you many times over. The good news is that you're still not perfect. I say good because being perfect is vastly overrated. You don't believe me yet, and that's okay. So the point is knowing that you're okay in the present, that you're enough in the present, and that will allow you to be magnificent in the future. Or so I'm told. They've been telling me that, but I'm not sure if I believe them. Okay. Write me back. Regards, Herschel. I love that. I love that. I love that. I'm going to tell you some touch points that I pull from that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I hope everybody's listening. It says, you said, every experience has good. And I heard you, I call them the three Fs. Friends, Mm -hmm. faith, forgiveness. And you are enough. I think that's wonderful, Junior. Thank you. I do. And what was interesting as I listened to you, mm-hmm. Senior, mm-hmm. was um, your instruction, if you have a choice, dance. Mm-hmm. And never, ever stay far away from your faith. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just like, I'm totally impressed. Mm-hmm. I am. Um, I think I'm, gonna, I'm going to use those as the answers to the questions I asked you before because I think these are a lot more meaningful okay. to what I ask you. Mm-hmm. And for our listeners, I want to add something. You know, every week we, we kind of have a take with doggy bag for uh, those moments during the week when you go, oh, man, I am just tired of being tired. Or maybe look in the mirror and go, what? You know? Uh, there's some good news. There's there's some really good news. And um, having listened to the leader and the son today, I ask you this question. What motivates you? What story are you writing? Are you living intentionally? Are you in touch with your talents, your gifts, your dreams? Do you understand that you are worthy, that you have everything inside of you you need to be the person you were created to be? Your calling in life is to fully express who you already are. Did you know the world will never see another human being like you? There is no one on the face of the planet that has what you have. Your uniqueness in every respect is your gift. 
life asks only one thing of you, to be a full expression of yourself so that you can leave your unique imprint on all those you encounter and upon the world. Never underestimate the power of your energy and how it ripples outwards to affect everything and everyone around you. Honor your intuition and act upon all of your inspirations. Well, folks, our time is about up. You know your seat at the table is guaranteed and you know how I love the connection. I can't do this without you. So until next time, this is Tyra G. My guest today has been Mr. Herschel Hart, uh, Mr. Herschel Holiday Sr. and Mr. Herschel Holiday Jr. and the loving support of Mrs. Herschel Holiday. Take good care now. Bye.